Palace Productions. Um, and um, I found myself hanging around the cutting room a lot, and I hated getting up early for set, and I suddenly realised that editors work gentlemen's hours. <laughs> so I thought, that's where I'm going. So I, I found an editor that would take me on as an assistant. I lied to him. I said I could sink brushes. I started one wintry weekend. He was blocked out in the country and rang me up and said, I'm snowed in. Can you sink all those rushes? So I hastily read the book on how to sink rushes. <laughs> he came in a few days later and said, gosh, you've sunk all the rushes. I thought you were lying. And I said, I was. <laughs> so I got there, though. A dark dungeon at TVNZ is what stands out for me from glass. Um, we used to cut it on this thing called the CMX Edge, which I spent the first season of Gloss learning how to operate with a wonderful guy called Roger Grant teaching me. I mean, it's a frustrating thing to cut because it was switched, shot and switched, and all you're doing is fixing up the cuts that were switched at the wrong place, really. It wasn't a huge job for cutting. Um, but the most fun was probably the series ends of, of seasons two and three, which my friend Peter Barrett directed both of both of which had a great cliffhanger, one of them, literally. Um, but of course, they'd sent, who was it? I think it was Peter Elliott, down a cliff hanging off wires. And of course, they hadn't budgeted for rotoscoping out the painting of the wires. <laughs> so this became a bit of a nightmare trying to cut around the wires. Eventually, we rotoscoped them. I don't think it was ever done that well, actually. Stuart Main I'd known for years, um, since before I even came to live in New Zealand, because. He was living with um, Peter Wells, who's a, some, who I'd met and got to know in London. So he was going over, in theory, to look at New Zealanders having spiritual experiences in India. And Craig Wright was on camera. And Michelle said to Craig, shoot a lot of Stuart, because it's really got to feature him. So even if he doesn't turn the camera on himself, you turn it on him. And then we did something very unusual for a documentary, which was to invent a love story that never happened. So the whole thing became, in theory, about his, or in part, about his love affair with who's a person who seemed to be the sound recordist. You know, because we had shots, because they were travelling around of, of Stuart in bed with a the guy. They never had an affair. And we'd admitted it halfway or third, two-thirds of the way into the doco. But that was an interesting one, because we could do all that. Plus, it was largely shot on DV in the early days of DV. So, um, and Craig had been fiddling with all the settings. We had lots of quite interesting kind of stop framey stuff going on that Craig had done in camera, and then I felt the need to match that in the cut. So I think there was hardly a shot in that documentary that wasn't treated, I mean, in some way. You know, so, you know, blurry lights, playing this, you know, I mean, when Stuart comes out of the hotel in Goa and looks out over the sea, if you look carefully, you'll see the seagulls are flying backwards and the surf is going out to sea. I mean, just for the sake of it, really, <laughs> because nothing was allowed to stay the same, which resulted in the most fantastic review, I think, in Australia. Um, it ran for SBS over there, and there was a piece in the paper there that said, God, Srinu and me, a film in which Stuart Main goes looking for God inside his underpants. <laughs> that was, and that was perfectly sort of kind of what it was in a way. But it was shot in a drought and set in a drought, and of course it rained halfway through. Um, and so all our brown grass turned green, so our continuity was shot to hell. It was a great shoot. I mean, in the middle of summer, it did start to rain. I mean, the frost is in the middle of the night, but it was still baking hot in the day. A lot of it was shot at night, and of course we were using kids, um, so a lot of it was done day for night. Simon Raby developed quite an interesting digital way of doing it. So we budgeted for 30 minutes of full digital grade. Um, and of course, when the brown grass went green, that wasn't going to work anymore. We, so we went. We were actually the first 35 mil film to be fully digitally graded, because Jackson had just bought the film unit, and he'd used that for Lord of the Rings. But only he'd only even then done part of his film that way. We ended up doing the whole thing, which was a really fascinating technical exercise. So that that was a very interesting way to go. I kind of knew in my heart that it would always go that way. So when the drought broke, I was kind of secretly quite pleased, thinking, well, I know they're going to have to find a little more, more budget, but this is going to be more fun now. You know? Another interesting thing, thinking back on that, that was a $3 million film, was considered pretty low budget for its time. Whereas, what, two years ago, I cut Dark Horse, which I think was 3.8 million, and that was considered a really high budget, sort of 10 or 12 years on. Now you sort of go, 
that tells you an awful lot about what's happened to our film budgets. <laughs> he opened with the guy screwing his best mate's girlfriend and vomiting in a urinal. You, he's not that likeable. And then halfway through the film, he steals the money that's been raised to save him from cancer and goes on off, off on a worldwide OE jaunt, basically. I mean, he's not the most likeable character. So, the th you know, the main thing was to reorder a whole load of scenes, play as much of Matt Whelan's charm as you could because you had to somehow go with them. And a lot of people still didn't. Anyone who'd been a bit loose in their youth, like myself, kind of got it. <laughs> Anyone who'd had good moral grounding probably hated it, <laughs> which meant that two of my sons liked it and one of them didn't. Um, <laughs> so it, that was the, 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 the key thing to get right in that film, because it was just to get you to at least understand his patterning of thought. Um, by reordering a few of those scenes at the beginning so that you ever had a really clear idea of where he was going and why, so that even if you didn't like him, at least you could f be with him. Annie Collins was the original cutter. She rang me up and she said, Jesus, I need help. They're shooting so much. Because James's shooting style was to shoot whole scenes in every take um, on two cameras. So the amount of footage was enormous and there was a lot of improvisation going on because of the kids, because they weren't going to... So all the kids in the chess clubs, it was all quite random what went on. You know, I was quite scared of what I was doing, and actually I thought I was cutting crap, to be honest. And I, you know, I had a weekend booked in Waiheke. I took all my rushes on the laptop and still kept going. <laughs> my wife's going, oh, I'm supposed to be having a holiday. And I was going, I've got to get this right. <laughs> so, just as we were entering the big last scene, I kind of woke up and the projector went, bzz, 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 the whole thing died. <laughs> I think, oh shit! <laughs> and the lights came on and someone from Park Road, I forget her name, came in and said, oh my God, I'm so sorry, something's gone wrong. And I looked around and most of the audience were in tears just as we hit the back scene. And she was going to be 20 minutes while we try and figure this out. And we sort of rushed out the back, what's going on, what's going on? OK, we'll fix it, we'll fix it. And so we went out and smoked about five cigarettes each with Tom and James, and James was going, how could this happen to me? And I'm going, Look, just calm down, it'll be all right, it'll be all right. And we went back in and we wound it back two scenes. Once they fixed it and ran it down, we still got tears again at the end. So I knew we were on a winner with that one. I think it was my favourite film. The story of a lot of old people keeping themselves fit and doing something and being active was one that I was really interested in. I wanted to, to work on a film that actually had some insight into being old and how it isn't necessarily what you think. And interestingly, the major scene in the middle of the film where they do their first big public performance, somehow that lost all its power. It was interesting because even though the earlier sequences had been tweaked and made better, and the Film Commission somehow saw that cut and their response was, why the hell did you change that scene? Or did anyone change that scene? It was working. And I kind of looked at it and I thought, that's odd. So I bunged up the two cuts, my old cut before I left, and not a frame had changed. And it was a real object lesson in what happens because we enter that scene on one particular character. And what we'd done to fix a storyline had been to diminish the emotional impact she had. Um, so that when we hit that scene on that character, we weren't thinking emotionally. So it's a real, you know, it's a fantastic sort of something that you could use for student lectures on, on the power of editing that what people tell you to do and what people respond to is not necessarily the thing you've got to do. You know, it was like, ah, oh, look, there's nothing wrong with that scene. It's actually, it was something ridiculous, like eight scenes earlier that you had to fix. And it was a really good object lesson in that one. In terms of moving from film to digital, on set or on camera. I mean, that's changed it in the volume of material. I mean, Dark Horse is a good casting point. Um, and also any documentary you can shoot, you can just keep those cameras rolling. It doesn't really cost you much. It does in the cut, in the post, because I've got to see it all. I'm not going to start cutting unless I see it all. So A, it's going to cost you a lot more of my time. B, it's going to cost you a lot more in terms of the assistance time. It might even delay your rushes screening the next day because there's just so much to process. Um, so, in a weird kind of way, things are slowing down again. So where, as I said earlier on, the, the cuts that you, you could cut a doco in three weeks, you know, well, you couldn't really do it well, but you did for television hours. Um, 
that cuts stretched out again. Um, things take longer, not shorter. <laughs> so it's an interesting kind of dynamic between the pluses and the minuses there. But I mean, obviously, as an editor, I'd rather have all the footage you can give me to work with. <laughs>